Thanks. Um, just by way of starting, if anybody wants to uh, ask a question or interrupt or have an argument, feel free. I always say this and nobody does, but it is a genuine invitation, all right? If you want to wait till afterwards, I'm here all day. Um, and I'm not going to be uncontroversial. And if I offend anybody, then I don't apologize for it. I will defend it later, right? So that will give you a sense of where we're coming. Um, this picture here shows a wolf, right? If you actually look at dogs in the wild, there are maybe three or four major variations, and it's a highly resilient species. Uh, once you domesticate dogs, you get this. Hundreds and hundreds of different species, most of which are genetically deformed, very few of which survive. That's where we are with Agile at the moment. We started off with three or four really brilliant ideas, the whole XP programming, the initial adoption of Scrum. These address different aspects. You know, the XP, I think, is probably closer to the spirit of Agile, uh, but Scrum puts enough structure that ID departments will adopt it. And we got those variations on the theme. But then what happens is we get lots and lots of different methods and tools and people jump on the bandwagon. Everybody claims they've got something which is unique and different, but actually they're destroying the original resilience of the wild animal. So at the moment, I want to argue there are a series of problems that we have in Agile. The first is we have a paradox. To get adoption, you need structure. But Agile is about removing structure. The success of SAFE, which I will say now I think is the worst thing that ever happened to Agile, and is a sign that Agile is coming to the end of its life cycle, um, is actually a waterfall design method disguised in Agile closing. So it basically says the way we deal with this is we put so much structure that people will feel safe. I mean, there's an irony in that. But actually, they can say they've been agile, but really, there's very little change or difference. Yeah? And that's the problem. And you have to deal with that as a paradox. And what I'm going to come to at the end is a different way at looking at how you structure. This is moving into systems architecture, which, to my mind, is the main deficiency in agile at the moment. Everybody's focused on clearing backlog. Nobody's focused on the total system. Right? So that's where I'm going to finish. So we need to think about structure in a different way. The second thing. Let's see if this is working, is a certification scam. Now, I'm sorry about this, but when I see people put on their CVs God knows how many initials after their name, all of which are based on turning up for a one-day class or reading a slide set set to you in order to gain money every year, I worry about the state of humanity. I have three sets of letters after my name. All of them came after three or four years of study and involved a proper examination. The idea you can say you're a master of anything by doing a two-day course and passing an open book exam over the next six weeks is a farce. All right? And basically, we're giving people certificates for attending courses, and a large amount of the Agile industry is now about training and accreditation or certification schemes. It's not about adding value. And because IT, uniquely among departments in companies, have lots of money for training, People are getting away with it, but they won't do for that much longer. And that's a major issue. We, we actually need to become a profession. Right? And a profession doesn't have trivial qualifications. Qualifications require experience and time. They're not just about turning up. So that's kind of like a big issue for me. Third one, and it relates to that, is too many people following recipes and not enough people training as chefs. So, I mean, we've all learned how, when I first went to university, I learned how to cook from recipe books. You follow the formula, you know, you get these ingredients, this equipment, you can produce a passable meal. But if you haven't got the right ingredients and you haven't got the right equipment, you're lost. Whereas a really good chef can turn up in your kitchen and can make a brilliant meal out of whatever you have there, because they don't understand the practice of cooking, they understand the theory of taste. They've served an apprenticeship, but they've also studied theory. They have a combination of learning and practice which gives them adaptability. And again, that's a big issue, and it's a very important metaphor, because the current training processes we have around IT in general, not just Agile, focus on recipes. They actually don't focus on chefs because they undervalue experience and intuition. Next one. 
starting at the end of somebody else's journey. This is called the Spotify problem. Um, how on earth McKinsey's are going down this route, I don't know. They used to be a competent management consultancy, but they're now saying adopt the Spotify model. Now, I know Spotify, I've worked with them. If you talk with them, they say, we don't have a model. What actually happened, we have a set of practices which emerged and evolved over time, are still evolving. And they succeed because of that evolutionary pathway. You have to live the same journey. You can't just copy where somebody got to. Because the experience of Spotify and going through that journey is part of it. Now, it doesn't mean we can't learn from their practices. There are some good ideas there. But just adopting them without realizing how they came about is very foolish. And part of what I'm going to argue, and this is a key phrase I'm going to use a lot, is you have to understand the dispositional state of a system. You have to understand how things are before you try and change things. What everybody is doing at the moment is deciding how things should be and then worrying about why they never happen. If you kind of like start with where things are and work out what you can change, you've got a better practice. Right? So that's a major issue, and that's coming up. And finally, this is the big one, confusing correlation with causation. This is an endemic problem in social science. I should say my first degree is physics and philosophy as a joint major. It was an indulgence when I did it, but it's proved valuable since. But it meant I was taught to have a contempt for social science from two completely different disciplines. Yeah, from a physicist's point of view, no social scientist ever gets enough data to form any valid conclusion. And the trouble with management science is even less, and the trouble with the agile movement is people are producing books based on limited partial observation of a retrospective understanding of a few limited case studies. Now, even when they do discipline work, they confuse correlation with causation. Uh, two of the worst books no, one is Startup, if anybody's read that. Very popular. The guy goes and studies a whole group book of companies who've succeeded, and he believes what they tell him. Well, problem number one, the way you remember things is different if you succeed than if you fail. This is actually a, a cognitive neuroscience fact. If you succeed, you forget about all the near failures. So actually listening to somebody who succeeded is quite dangerous. But even if we get over that little problem, Right? And I remember asking him this. I said, well, did you study the companies who failed? And he said, well, why would I do that? Well, this is called scientific discipline and method, but never mind. All right? And I said, well, we did that when I was at IBM with Dorothy Leonard at Harvard. And what we found is all the startup companies who failed did all the same things as the startup companies who succeeded. So all the things listed in your book were copied by people who failed. The point is you're dealing with a market. There are so many players that some are bound to succeed. Yeah, just simply on statistical chance. Now that's kind of like one problem. Now, the other major one is Lacroix's reinventing the organization, where he only selects aspects of cases which support the ideology he wants to support in the first place. And kind of like conveniently forgets everything from Zappos, etc., which doesn't actually match that book. But there's a huge market to get out a popular book which says, follow this simple formula and everything will be okay. Despite the fact that the history of humanity says that's a bad approach, uh, we still keep falling for it. Yeah? The other problem is actually the straightforward statistical one. So if Serbia wants to increase the number of Nobel Prizes it wins per year, all you have to do is increase the consumption of dark chocolate. This is actually a good thing if you think about it, all right? Dark chocolate consumption per head of population directly correlates with Nobel Prizes won per head of population by country for the past 30 years. Okay, go out and eat chocolate, increase the scientific footprint of, of Serbia. Yeah, the other one which I do believe is suicides by drowning. The peaks directly coincide with the release of Nicolas Cage movies, but I can see a causal <laughs> yeah, relationship within that. All right? You shouldn't confuse correlation with causation. The fact that 15 or 16 successful companies did something and say they did it and it succeeded because of this doesn't mean if you do this, you too will succeed. All contexts are different. And that ideological approach is kind of like the one which really worries me. 
in that people are now basically, it's like the mindset arguments, right? Mindset is a very dubious concept in cognitive neuroscience anyway. Yeah, the concept you have a mindset is actually a very, you, you have interactions with people. And the interactions with other people determine what you think far more than anything to do with mindset. So it's much more complex. But what everybody's trying to do is to say, that, you know, so they start with the odd ideology, the belief, and then they go and find the aspects of the cases to support that ideology. They don't... Oh, so, okay, cool. Okay, so I'm going too far away. Sorry about that. I'm wandering too far. Okay, so those are issues or problems. Yeah? Now, what I started to do 20 or 30 years ago, because I've lived through fad cycles many times now, right? Um, Agile is going through exactly the same fad cycle as knowledge management, um, as blue ocean strategy. I could just go through the whole list, all right? All of them promises the solution to the problem of life, the universe, and everything. And because they're not well read, they don't know the answer to that is 42 anyway. If you don't know that, you need to read more. Yeah, and it's kind of like it gets a bit boring after a time to people see people saying them make the same mistake. So what my research group originally did in IBM, then we left to create Cognitive Edge, was to say, why don't we start with natural science, because that actually has an evidence base, and use that as a constraint on social systems. So if we know how systems work and we know how people make decisions, that's a much better starting base to create methods than partial observation of half-remembered practice. So this is called praxis, or a naturalistic approach to sense-making, if you want the academic language. Okay, so let's go through a few of these. Now I'm going to go through three. There's lots more, but three main ones. This is called inattentional blindness. So you give a group of radiologists. Radiologists have an extensive training period, on average 15 to 20 years' experience. You give them a batch of x-rays, which is a limited information source compared with, say, a user requirement. And you ask them to spot anomalies on a set of x-rays. And on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. 83% of radiologists don't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. And the 17% who do come to believe they were wrong when they talked to the 83% who didn't. Now, this is called inattentional blindness. And you can't avoid it. And of course, there are consequences. Firstly, that's my favorite slide to illustrate Agile, by the way. A sheep in wool's clothing, but you can work on that. Um, first of all, we do not see what we do not expect to see. Now, that's actually part of what we are as a human being. The reason the radiologists don't scan it is the most that anybody in this room scans of available information if you're really focused and concentrating is about 5%. In practice, it's less than that. So having scanned 5% of what's available to you, you then do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match, with your own memories of things that you've learned, things that you've done, and the memories and stories of people you know that you recall. And then you do something called conceptual blending. You blend together the narrative patterns which seem most appropriate to form an impression of what's going on, and you make a decision. So based on a very partial data scan, privileging your surface memories, you make a decision. That, that's how you do it. Now, in evolutionary terms, you can see why this is, worth, is worthwhile. If you think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you want to artistically scan 100% available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and have an identified lion look up best practice case studies on how to avoid being eaten by lions? Uh, by the time you've gone through that process, the only document of any use to you will be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only example I've found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore written by a survivor. Right? Uh, we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly, privileging our most recent experiences. Nothing wrong with that, but it's reality. 
Now the good news on this is there's a huge amount out there we're not seeing which has value. But you can't say, oh, this is bad, we should observe more, because that would make you non-human. The only people who see everything are people who are fully autistic, and they can't operate, because they've got too much information flow. So what we need to do is to diversify the scanners and the cognitive biases so that we find the 17% before they talk to the 83%. And I'll talk a bit about that later as we come through. But that's just reality. Secondly, hindsight is not the same thing as foresight. When we look backwards, we can all see what makes sense. Yeah, with the benefit of hindsight, everybody can show you a causal pattern. But if you notice, economists are really good at this, by the way. After a major recession, they can all tell you exactly why it happened. But none of them get it right up front. If you look at any major terrorist outrage, after the event, anybody can trace a causal pattern, but actually nobody can identify it up front. Now, this is an aspect of a complex system I'll come back to later, but hindsight is actually very dangerous in humans if we assume it will give to foresight. We can learn from the past, but we shouldn't say it mandates what we can know about in the pressure. One of the ways that we can do this is to use ritual, not rules. Remember I said you scan 5% of what data? Well, actually, if you change people's clothes, you can change which 5% they perceive. We do a lot of this in safety now. If we get lorry drivers to strap on heated belts as they get out of their lorry before they unload, we effectively do a cognitive shift from lorry driver to loader. Now, what ritual does in human beings is it changes our perception, it changes what we scan. Yeah, we've got some experimental data which shows if somebody who codes leaves the room, changes their clothes before they test their code, they will actually see the code in a different way, particularly if you associate certain tiles of dress with actual testing as opposed to coding. Because, of course, if you've written a whole bunch of stuff, you assume it's right anyway, so you're looking at it with the assumption it's right, not the assumption it's wrong. Yeah, so ritual is actually really important in human beings. I was at a conference, an agile conference in Portugal last year, and they made us wear dinner jackets, you know, black tie. All this, I mean, I haven't worn one of those for years. And suddenly I'm putting this stuff on, and I realize I'm seeing the world very differently than if I turn up in jeans and a T-shirt. Yeah, I don't like presenting in a suit. Yeah, I just don't feel right and not relaxed enough. So if conference organizers insist on it, it's amazing how often airlines lose my luggage so I have to turn up in transit clothes. Yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, there's no point in fighting bureaucracy. I learned that in IBM. You just work out how the bureaucrats work and you play the game, all right? But you probably know that better than I do. So ritual is valuable. And the final one, this is kind of like a key framework I developed some time ago, which is called see, attend, act. Do I see the data? Do I pay attention to the data? Well, I act on the data are three separate processes. Most systems designers assume it's all about getting the first one right. They basically say if we present the right information to the right people at the right time, and they have the right competencies and the right training, they will make the right decision. Well, that's just not the case. Whether they see it is questionable. Whether they pay attention to it, if they see it, is questionable. And whether they can act on it, even they pay attention to it, is another matter altogether. One of the things IT people constantly forget is that C-level executives have to deal with politics. Even if they know something is right, they may not be able to do it. This is something you can't like realize. Right? So you need to separate in design. Is this system designed to get the right information to people? That's one question. The second question is, how can I make sure they pay attention to it? And that's a separate question. And the other, this is actually a question about how you do your requirements and initial capture, is how can I set up a system so people will act when they pay attention rather than require a secondary justification? And that's a very simple three-part question but it's very rarely asked. Next bit of science. Uh, a lot of you are very young. How many people have got children? 
Okay, do you tell them bedtime stories? Do you tell them how Janet and John stayed at home, followed the company best practice, and achieved the family KPIs? <laughs> uh, before you get worried about this, there is actually firms in the US who will do that for families. Literally, they're going through that process with families. It's very scary, right, in terms of the way it works. No, you basically tell them stories about how Janet and John went into the woods against mummy and daddy's advice and they met evil witches and wolves. We make sure they get rescued at the end because we want them to sleep at night. But all of fairy stories in all storytelling cultures all over the world basically tell stories of failure, not stories of success. The learning is in the failure, not in the success. The success is like a candy coating at the end. The reality and the excitement is all the things which go wrong. Just think about the films you like, the books you read. Yeah? So why on earth do we build best practice systems? When we actually know people won't pay attention to them. So let's look at some of the implications. Firstly, stories of failure are more effective than stories of success. Telling people things, you, you learn this as you get to sea level. Telling people what you don't want is actually far more to get compliance than telling them what you do want. You can set a direction much better by, we don't want to do this, do we? Because that actually gives you some guidance, but it gives people more freedom to make choices as the context shifts. Right? People learn, I mean, we've done a lot of work in safety on this, the story everybody remembers in one manufacturing company we're working with isn't, I clipped my harness on so I was safe. It was, you know Fred, he didn't clip his harness on, he fell off the gantry. Lucky his colleagues was underneath, so he broke his fall. His colleague broke his leg, but Fred survived. Everybody in the manufacturing plant tells you that story 15 years after it happened because it's a learning story. Yeah, go back to your organization. Who do you respect most? The people who tell you, do it like me and you will have no problems. Or the people who say, let me tell you what went wrong for me when I was doing the same thing. That's far more valuable, isn't it? Right. So that means best practice systems are not as effective as worst practice systems. And we actually build narrative-based worst practice systems for companies because they carry more learning and have more participation. And the other thing, by the way, is fictional stories can convey more learning than factual stories. A story doesn't have to be factual to be a learning story. And that's the other mistake people make. Next one. If you don't know it, art and music come before language in human evolution. This is actually really important. Because human language evolved from abstractions, not from naming things. And one of the reasons this is powerful is it allows us to make novel connections very quickly. How many people play music when they're trying to focus or concentrate? Yeah, loads. I actually play different music according to what type of article I want to write because it's kind of like a trigger mechanism. But we need, what happens with music is it takes you up a level of abstraction. So you don't concentrate on the mundane, but you see novel or unusual connections. Right, so though painting starts probably as scratches on a cave wall, it then actually gives human beings huge advantage because by moving up a level of abstraction, we can create rapid novelty. We suddenly see unusual connections. Right, so abstraction is key. And some of our work, for example, on metadata structures is, created, is used on creating deliberately ambiguated abstract metastructures rather than words or keywords or taxonomies or whatever. And then we get onto this concept we got of failure games. Again, this is something we run for organizations. We set up a situation yeah, where over three, three sessions, parallel teams are doomed to fail. You have human games masters for this. What actually happens, by the end of three rounds of continuous failure, people are scanning 25 times more data before they make a decision than when they think they will succeed. Right? So actually, training people in environments where they can't succeed has more learning in it yeah, than training people in environments to win, which also has a cultural impact. 
Yeah, because actually, if you always go on training with games where you have to win, you encourage the wrong sort of behavior. Yeah, whereas actually, if everybody realizes after round two they're going to lose, it's kind of like, you know, it's inevitable, then they move into a different mode and it's more collaborative in terms of the way it works. So actually, working through failure is more successful. Third bit of science, complexity science. Now, this is kind of one of the big things at the moment, and I keep telling people you shouldn't confuse it with the popular forms of systems thinking. Yeah, most people, when they talk about systems thinking, you know, are basically thinking about something where you define where you want to be and you try and close the gap. Complexity says it's more important to define where you are and to see what you can change. And when the reason for that is a complex system is so intertwined and entangled that the same thing never happens again the same way twice, expect by accident. In a complex system, everything is connected and constrained by everything else, but many of the connections can't be known. One of the things I introduced to the field some years ago is the concept of what's called a dark constraint, which is a reference to dark energy in cosmology. Uh, you can see the effect of something, but you can't see what's causing it. Uh, and that's actually very common in a complex adaptive system. Yeah? So a complex system, to use the key phrase, is dispositional, it's not causal. Uh, it has no linear causality, it has dispositionality which you can measure. You can actually make statements about probabilities, possibilities and plausibilities, and those three are different, in the present, but you can never make a predictive statement about the future. And where we are now in IT design is this is increasingly where we need to be. Where we were codifying accounting systems, which is when I started, yeah, there were, there were manual systems then, we knew exactly what the outcome was meant to be, so there wasn't a problem. Now, unintended consequences, which are the only inevitable concepts of, of working in a complex system, the only thing I can say for certain is if you intervene in a complex system, you will get unintended consequences. And that means we have to radically change the way we do system design because the bigger the intervention, the bigger the promise, the bigger the unintended consequence, and the more reluctance people will have to admit it hasn't worked. Right? And that's actually a key thing if you think about it in system design. And I'll come back to that on scaffolding. Well, shall I give an illustration now. The biggest disaster in, core in government purchasing in modern years was the British Health Service buying a patient record system. Anybody remember this or read about it? And to be the biggest economic disaster in government procurement is a very high hurdle to pass, all right? It takes a lot of achievement on this. Now, I was on the IBM bid team for this, but I was thrown off the bid team because I said we should no bid it because what they, the requirement was to have a, a centralized database of all patient records on common hardware accessed by all med... And you can almost hear the vision of this, yeah? Everybody said we'll be, no, there'll be no confusion, everything will be in one place. Now, I remember going into the B team and say, this is doomed, right? Because there's no way you can enforce common hardware in the human system. You've got existing systems, you've got multiple levels of confidentiality, we're going to have a disaster. Right? And actually, that's what happened. Fortunately, IBM lost the bid. Yeah? The people who won it lost a huge amount of money, and there, were, there was a lot, a lot of lost status on this. Yeah? What we propose instead, which has actually now been adopted by other health bodies, is what you do is you focus on giving everybody their individual health record on a credit card or an implanted chip. Implanted chips are very good for this, and if you've got a long-term disease, you've got no problem with that and then create common reader technology so we can read and write from the chip to any medical system. And we said that will cost a few million, and then we'll see what patterns of behavior emerge before we further structure it. You see the different principle? In a complex system design, you change the interactions in a safe-to-fail way and see what happens, but you can only understand a complex system by interacting with it. You've got inherent uncertainty. So the consequences on this are fairly clear. That's a hindsight picture. Yeah, retrospective coherence. Actually, a quick question here. Um, has anybody heard the English phrase, why didn't we join up the dots? 
Okay, it normally comes after a major disaster, right? So you've got a major government inquiry, everything went wrong. You get a commission of inquiry, and of course, with the benefit of hindsight, they can all work out exactly what went wrong. If you look at the congressional report on 9-11, uh, you know, why didn't we pay attention to this FBI agent who said people had been trained to fly and take off, but not to land? After 9-11, we can see just how significant that is, and the phrase is, why didn't we join at the dots? Have you ever familiar with that phrase? Okay, I would normally draw this, but I can't use the iPad. If I have four dots, there are six connections which can form between the dots. That means there are 64 possible patterns that can form between dots and links and connections. If I go up to 10 dots, how many patterns do you think there are? Four dots is 64. Any guesses? What's, what do you say, 1,000? Just over 1,000. How many people think that's too much? Too little? Not answering because you know you'll get it wrong? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll save it. It's just over 3.6 billion. If I go up to 12, it's just over 4.8 quadrillion. How many dots are there in the human system? How many possible patterns are there? With the benefit of hindsight, anybody can see which pattern was significant, but it doesn't mean you'll see it in advance. Secondly, dispositions. I've talked about that, and I'll give you some illustrations in a minute. Thirdly, how people interact is far more important than who or what they are. This is actually one of the, ins and this is a real problem because management science is dominated by a cultural way of thinking which dominates Northern Europe and United States, which is a focus on the individual, not the collective. Now, and actually this is a real problem. It's called the difference between social atomism and commutarianism, which is not the same thing as communism, all right? It's a different word, all right? Commutarianism. So in social atomism, the belief is the individual is everything, and all teams are constructs of individual self-interest. In commutarianism, which dominates Africa, Asia, the Celtic fringe, and Southern Europe, the interaction with people defines who you are. Right? Now, the science now backs up the latter, not the former. We're defined by who we interact with. The whole concept of Myers-Briggs in any of those psychological tests, which are actually pseudoscience, there is no scientific basis whatsoever to Myers-Briggs. Now, if you want the story of it, I'll happily tell anybody later. It's designed to put people into little boxes so we can treat them like widgets. The reality is people change depending on who they're interacting with, and that change can be radical or sudden. So in a complex system, you focus on changing interactions, not changing people. Now, and that actually has major issues for cultural change and everything else. One of the reasons why every time I go to an Agile conference is they say the culture stops people being Agile. How do I create an Agile mindset? Is they're defining the problem about individual change rather than defining the problem as changing interactions. Yet changing interactions is much easier and more ethical. Trying to change individuals is actually a priori not possible. The best you'll get is people will pretend to be agile, or you'll give them the language of the agile mindset, and they'll parrot it back to you. We learned that really fast in IBM. What's the current corporate HR language? Okay, we'll use find and replace to put that language in on any document, right? And if you haven't learned how to do that yet, you might as well get into it. One of the things we've been using a lot lately are called trios. Uh, three people are a more stable condition than two people. And to give you the illustration, if you go out with a stranger, somebody you don't know before, yeah, and two of you go for dinner, there's a huge amount of stress because you have no knowledge of each other. If three of you go out, the stress is considerably relieved because the interaction changes. Yeah? And three is a, a basic number in humans. We can cope with threes. You all know this, don't you? If three princes get sent on a quest, the third prince will succeed. All right? And there's all sorts of cognitive reasons why threes work, by the way. It's actually quite cute from a quantum mechanics point of view. It's kind of like we know about threes from there as well. So, for example, some of the stuff we're now doing on user requirements capture, because systems analysts are subject to cognitive blindness like nobody else, 
is to create a trio with somebody who sees the system as a whole. That's a systems architect or an end system tester. Testers are quite good at this because they worry about what's going to happen. Yeah? With a bright young coder who can prototype and a user trained to talk to IT people. It's much easier to train users to talk to IT people than it is to train IT people to understand users. Yeah? I mean, it actually is a lot easier for reasons I can go into later. And what we do is we actually create 15 or 16 trios and we throw them at the problem for two weeks and see what they come back with. You see a different approach? We're deliberately introducing diversity in small experiments into the system rather than try and create something overnight. And we actually use that sort of three structure quite a lot in techniques. Because what you want, remember the people don't see the gorilla? It's lots of people from different backgrounds doing tasks in parallel because then some will notice the gorilla. If you have a highly structured approach, you're going to miss it. And finally, shifting from rules to heuristics. Heuristics are rules of thumb. Now, I'll just give you the military illustration and then move on. Uh, one of the ways that Napoleon radicalized warfare, aside from having officers who were professional military people who weren't aristocrats, which was considered unique and dangerous at the time, but what he also did, he said, if the battlefield plan breaks down, follow the sound of the guns. Now, that may sound actually trivial, but it was revolutionary. Because up till that time, everybody waited from orders from the general sat on a horse on the top of a hill, so the system didn't have adaptive capacity. Now, if you didn't have time to wait for the orders, there was a rule of thumb which you followed, and you knew that the other commanders would be doing the same thing, so the system had self-organizing capacity. If you then work at the work of Klein and others with the US Marines, if in doubt, capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. Now notice, they're empirically measurable whether you did it. They're not abstract statements of principle. But actually, heuristics give you much more capacity for self-organization than just saying we should be in self-organizing teams. If you say we have self-organizing teams with deliberate diversity in their formation, uh, you can't just with people who think like you, and they will always follow those heuristics. You've put in a management structure which people can buy into, but it's a management structure compatible with complexity. So those are my three basic sciences. From that, that brings me on to Kinevin. Now, I'm just going to mention this very briefly, yeah, because there's other stuff I want to do, and there's loads of material online on this. There's online training courses. Yeah? Um, and also, if you want to look at Liz Keogh's work, um, she's done a whole bunch of videos about Kinevin, which have a, a better design for programmers than what I can do, right? So, recognize diversity. Kinevin is a sense-making framework. Now, sense-making is a really important word. My definition of sense-making, which is different from Vike, is how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it? And with that concept comes a concept of sufficiency. You'll never know enough to act but the issue is, when do you know that you know enough for a particular type of action? And that's what Kinevin is about. Yeah? It's a Welsh word, by the way, and it's pronounced Kinevin. It has no equivalent in English, which says something about the English. All right? um, they think it means habitat. All right? In Welsh, it means the place of your multiple belongings. It's a sense you belong to many different strands in your own and your collective's history, which are changing in the present, not just in the past, and you live in that flow. So it's a good word for complexity. It's not the same as Heimat or those other words. Um, the reason the English don't have an equivalent, by the way, is they've never had a habitat of their own. They've only ever stolen other people's. You know, we haven't forgiven them for the 13th century. We have very long memories in Wales, right? Okay, so the Canadian framework looks like this. And it takes the idea of complexity, but it looks at two other types of system. An ordered system, which is divided into two, in an ordered system, there's enough constraint that you've got predictability. Right? The difference between obvious and complicated is in the obvious domain, everybody can see what the relationship is between cause and effect, and everybody buys into it. So in civilized countries, we drive on the left-hand side of the road. Yeah? 
So if you're in Australia or Britain or South Africa, you drive on the left. If you're in Serbia or Germany or France, you drive on the right. If you're in southern Italy, you follow the next car, match speed, avoid collision, and ignore any traffic rules whatsoever, right? I mean, that's kind of like the way it works. It's, it's a flocking behavior. It's quite relaxing once you know that, right? Now, those, by the way, are heuristics. So basically, in an obvious thing, we can apply best practice. We can say, where are we? It's Britain. Okay, that's in the category of countries which drive on the left. I'll drive on the left. Then if it's complicated, then it's not self-evident to the decision maker. It may be self-evident to the expert. So I've got to go through some sort of analysis process yeah, to actually get validation or confirmation before I take action. But there is a right answer. And there we talk about good practice, not best practice, which means there's a degree of freedom. The system is less tightly coupled. If you over-constrain a system, yeah, or you make it too rigorous, then it will break into catastrophe. So, you know, favorite story in this is, I didn't volunteer for IBM, I was conscripted. They bought the company I was a part of. And the first thing they did is they banned our free coffee and they banned alcohol. Now, coffee, the coffee-alcohol cycle is critical to good quality software development. I mean, it was like, what have they done to us, all right? Yeah, you, need, you need alcohol to talk with users, you need coffee to sober up to write the code, then you need even more alcohol because the users never want what you can prove they asked for, they want something else instead, all right? So, you know, we obviously we're dealing with bureaucrats, but we overcame that, there are ways around that. Then they banned us for buying food for staff. Now, classic big company move, right? Now, by this level time, I'm C-level executive, right? If you're C-level, you only ever get to see angry customers. You need to be nice to see level, right? Because you keep all the good customers for yourselves. We only get them when they're so pissed off with you and we get them too late to do anything, all right? So a, a C-level executive, the minute you get a phone call, it's, oh my God, what have the bastards done to me now? Or it's got your, your first reaction. So either way, I said, look, I got an emergency call out the other night. Yeah, I'm duty executive, right? Four o'clock in the morning, I've got a VAX cluster down, yeah, which has got an emergency service on it with massive penalty clauses if we're not up by 9 a.m. I didn't say the reason the VAX cluster is down is you bloody idiots said that people could learn how to upgrade an operating system from the manual and didn't need to go on a course, right? That had been a $200 saving, but there was no point on that because they get defensive. There was something like a f five million penalty clause. And I said, the only thing I can do is to keep people away from the systems program as well they fix the mix. My job is to stop anybody asking them what they're doing and asking for update reports because then they'll be stopped from doing it. And I've got to keep them awake, so I've got to buy them pizza and Coke. They looked a bit worried at that point, and I realized this could be misinterpreted. I said, pizza and Coca-Cola, and they relaxed a bit. <laughs> Though it did give us some ideas for the future. I said, well, so what do I do? And they said, well, okay, we understand that, right? If you really need to do this and you get vice presidential approval two days in advance, you can buy food for staff. Now, at this point, you breathe, all right? Because you mustn't point out the stupidity of this because then they'll get defensive. So we said, that's brilliant. We would never have thought of that. You know, irony and sarcasm are wonderful weapons against bureaucrats. We said, what happens on the extremely rare occasion where we don't get two days' notice of a major crisis? I mean, they, they, the concept of crises not having proper planning process is unusual for HR, right? It's, they don't expect it. And they looked even more reluctant, so they said yes in a way which means no. Bureaucrats are brilliant at this. They said country general manager approval after the event. Now, you know what that means is your expenses will disappear into his office. They'll never get signed. And if you start to complain, your name will appear on the wrong sorts of lists and you don't want to be on those lists at quarter end in a big company. So the practice emerged. I hasten to add, of course, I never did this, and nobody I knew would ever do this. Right? This is just something we heard other people were doing, was to overtip a London taxi driver. Because if you overtip a London taxi driver, they give you a blank receipt. Well, I'm told they give you a blank receipt. I, of course, have never done this. Right? Um, the blank receipt was then completed for the amount of money spent on food and drink for staff, a parallel set of books were kept for internal audit purposes, and the responsible manager claimed for a taxi and took the bus. 
I gave this as an example at the Scrum Alliance conference in Berlin a couple of years ago. This is 18 years after the event. Three people from IBM ran up to me, showed me their wallets full of blank, passport, blank, blank receipts, and said, we're still doing that. Did you invent it? <laughs> if you over-constrain a system, people will find a way around the system. The problem with that is that fraud has now become endemic. All right, it's the same in health and so We've actually proved in three major projects over the last two years that the reason for mental breakdown in emergency services is not the job, but the health and safety regulations which over-constrain them so they can't do what they know they need to do. Right? So this is this boundary and Kinevin between obvious and chaotic. If you over-constrain the system, the system will find a workaround so it will look like it's working, but sooner or later there will be a catastrophic failure, and that's a bad place to be. You act sense respond. Then, of course, we've got the complex domain where we do parallel safe-to-fail experiments. Now, parallelism is key. You can't do one experiment to see if you get it right. Because that's where you hit what's called the Hawthorne effect. Yeah, this is from experiments done in the 1920s in a cable manufacturer in New York where they increased lighting levels to see if that improved productivity, and it did. If they were agile consultants, they would now publish a book called Light the Secret to Productivity and have a two-day certification course on how to switch on light bulbs yeah, I mean, that would be the agile approach, right? Then they had some pretension to be real scientists, so they lowered the lighting level and people became more productive. And what they found, which has been validated since, if you do something novel and pay attention to people, it will always work the first two or three times. Which is all that anybody ever claims on an agile method is it worked the last time I did it. And that's called a Hawthorne effect. It's why pilot projects actually don't scale. Now, Kinevin now has two liminal domains, and these are important. Those are shown as green. So the liminal domain into chaos here is actually where we deliberately create a chaotic environment in order for complete novelty to emerge. Yeah, I'm not going to go into that much now. Chaos, by the way, in Kinevin is always a temporary space. The way you know somebody in Agile doesn't understand it is if they put things in there permanently. Yeah, crossing the road in Mumbai is not chaotic, it's complex. I know how to cross the road in Mumbai. You step on the street and walk in a straight line at a constant speed, and the traffic will move around you. Yeah, if you hesitate, you're lost, right? Um, in terms of the way it works. Yeah? Um, the liminal domain between complex and complicated is actually more important, because that's actually where things like Scrum fit. We now know enough to know the right, what we need to do, but we've got to go through a series of short cycle experiments to make sure we get it right. The great power of Scrum is its ability to make things on the borderline with complex complicated. But it's not a pure complex systems technique, because it does one thing in sequence, not multiple things in parallel. Remember I suggested throwing 15 trios at something? That's a complex systems technique. What comes out of that will end up with two or three of those experiments which confuse and go into Scrum. The other one I invented years ago is called Triple Eight, or Deliberate Mutation. You actually get a prototyping team working directly with users for a day. That's called a RAD workshop. Yet they then hand over their prototype to another programming team on an eight-hour time difference without access to the original user need. And they're allowed eight hours to improve it they hand it on to another team on another eight hours time difference, and then it comes back to the original team 24 hours later. Every time we've run that, users have looked at it and said, God, I wouldn't have thought of that. Can I please have it? So you're introducing rapid short cycle mutation rather than assuming that users know what they want in advance because they don't. And the either bigger work we're doing at the moment is on mapping unarticulated needs. Because where IT becomes strategic, because people, users, don't know what technology can do, so they don't know what to ask for. Yeah, mapping unarticulated needs in a structured process so that technology can address those in a prototype mode and then test the understanding. All of those three things I've mentioned are complex systems techniques. All of them feed into Scrum, which of course can feed into Waterfall, which of course can feed into time boxing. 
There's nothing wrong with waterfall yeah, for large-scale infrastructure projects. The trouble is we get pedantic about this. I was working with Telstra in Australia. Uh, they're doing telecoms infrastructure. That's not a scrum development method. Yeah, you're building a deep infrastructure where you know what you've got to do and you haven't got high levels of user interactivity. It's waterfall. But nobody got promoted for not being on the Agile teams, so they created one-year sprints so they could say they would be Agile. Another example of human beings working around the system. So Kinevin is a way of identifying how you use different methods interacting with each other rather than one single approach. That's another reason why I don't like things like safe, less, not as bad, because it's got flexibility. Yeah, but it's getting more rigid because it's trying to compete with safe. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you, you never imitate the apex predator. You want to be different, but don't take me there. I've got an argument with Craig on that shortly. Right? Basically, you want what you want is a multi-methods approach. One of the reasons you want that is this is a gaping void cartoon is if you want a carpenter to do his best work, let him use his own tools. Yeah, different things work for different people and different times in context. What we need are frameworks which allow us to use different things in context rather than structures which force us into a bland uniformity. Right? So we need structure, yeah, but we don't need so much structure it's stifling in terms of the way it works. Okay, coming to a conclusion now. In a complex system, granularity matters. You'll notice what I've been doing with the complex system techniques is work with smaller and smaller things in rapid cycles rather than big things. You scale a complex adaptive system by deconstruction and recombination, not by imitation and aggregation. It's why when SAFE first came out, and I remember, I think actually it was in Serbia I first saw SAFE, at a conference, and I remember saying this is wrong a priori because it's taking a complex system and trying to scale it by aggregation so it can't work. You scale by decomposition and recombination. Think about how DNA works. It doesn't work by imitating the species. It works by mutation and change. Decomposition, recombination in terms of the way it works. Which actually means understanding dispositional states is key. This is a picture I was walking the southeast west coast of England this year yeah, if you walk a lot, you no need to map the dispositional state in advance. You can't, you know, the path may be there, but it may have broken. I got involved in a landscape, landslip there a few years back. Yeah, just arrested. I mean, the whole land went away with me under it, right? Unfortunately, my body remembered Isaac's Rex, so I used trekking poles to stop myself a meter before I went over the cliff. I've never quite forgotten that occasion, right? And I sh wasn't paying attention to the dispositional state. It was pouring with rain. You could see small, I should not have gone down that path. I wasn't paying attention. Right? Ma mapping dispositions is key. And this is actually where I don't use mindset, I talk about attitudes. Attitudes are lead indicators, compliance is a lag indicator. If we can measure attitudes, we know what's possible. Yeah? And actually intervention to change attitudes is not pejorative. If we get a compliance breach, we've got a major problem. So these are examples of dispositional maps. This is actually looking at safety. Uh, the left is manufacture in a civilian environment. The right is manufacture in a military environment. The source data for this is engineers can keeping continuous records on the floor and interpreting their experience into high abstraction metadata. That means you don't know what the right answer is. Yeah, we don't rely on AI, by the way, because actually human beings can interpret data better than AI. Uh, those can create good training data sets for AI downstream. The vertical dimension is rule compliance. The horizontal dimension is job completion. Now, sense making, you want to see a pattern instantly. You can see on the left, you either get the job done or you follow the rules. The two are mutually incompatible states. Every focus group, every questionnaire, Every expert interview said they were doing both because they knew that was the right answer. And they knew that's what they were meant to say. But the micro-observations, the granularity point again, on a day-to-day -day basis showed a completely different pattern. The right looks better because you've got that pattern in the top right, which is rule compliance job completion. But what we can do on these is we can click on them and see the original observation, not interpreted. 
When you look at that, it's all nuclear weapons testing. Well, nuclear weapons testing creates an existential quality to rule compliance and job completion, which won't replicate elsewhere. We then got get the job done, ignore the rules, and we got this pattern down bottom left. I've given up. I'm just doing what I need to do to survive. We're seeing that with nursing staff in hospitals as well, by the way. In an emergency, they're brilliant. On a day-to-day -day basis, they break the rules to provide empathetic care, but increasingly, they've had enough. If that dispositional state grows much more, the system will go through a phase shift, and it will be almost impossible for it to recover. Now, the intervention method here, if you look on the right, is not to run a program talking about how wonderful the top right-hand area would be, but you see that little cluster of material? I don't know what I've got. Oh, I've got one. See this? This is called an adjacent possible. It's a pattern of behavior which is in a better place than this, but is closer to it. So what I do is I click on that, and I say, what can I do tomorrow to create more observations like these and fewer observations like those? Now, that is a whole new theory of change. I don't use things, how can we create a more safety-conscious culture? How do we create an agile mindset? I say, what can we do tomorrow to create more stories like these and fewer stories like those? And that can engage anybody. And we're using these maps now. These, is, uh, these are maps where we presented an infographic and got everybody in the organization to index it, high abstraction metadata. This is a dominant pattern. Remember the x-ray? That's the 83%. That and that are the 17%. So now we know where people are seeing the problem differently, and we go and look at that before we talk with the rest. We're using a lot of this on policy making and decision support, is you need that diverse representation before you jump to conclusions. So... That leads me on to the thing I want to finish with, or more or less finish with, with the culture problem. Everybody blames culture when things go wrong. Now, this cartoon illustrates it. You can't engineer culture. Yeah, the idea you can say what sort of culture you want and engineer it is a myth. Yeah, in fact, if you try and do that, you'll probably create a negative culture rather than a positive culture in terms of the way it works. So if you saw those dispositional maps we were making, and this is kind of like a... Sorry, the, uh, the cats will become relevant later, right? Those are the two latest additions to the Snowden household, right? Uh, we are a cat household, not a dog household. Uh, that is the bag I normally bring to conferences, but the cats have decided they want to sleep on it. The two expensive cat beds bought by my wife are never occupied, but my leather briefcase is occupied, and if you're a cat household, you know you don't disobey the cats, all right? They know they were once gods and are waiting for us to worship them again, right? That's kind of that. These are the kinds of things we're currently working on. Attitudes to cybersecurity are more important than compliance. Attitudes to well-being are more important than actual sickness. Now, you see where I'm going with this sort of stuff? If you can measure attitudes, you can intervene early, and you can intervene in a different way. And what the dispositional maps do is to show that. This is actually from a cultural map, and you can see this has actually got different cultures, and people think in different ways. But there are overlaps. So that's a resilient system. It has cultural diversity, but it's got enough in common that it can unite when it needs to. And we call that coherent heterogeneity. If everybody believed and thought the same things and thought the same values, you'd have homogeneity and the system wouldn't have adaptive capacity. Now, so that ability to very quickly measure these is part of what we're doing these days. And the final thing I wanted to finish on is where I think Agile needs to move, which is starting to understand that different types of structure work in different contexts. So if I look at different... We've spent a year working on alternatives to on design thinking, because design thinking has become commodified like Agile has become commodified. Yeah? And one of the things we've done is to the typology of scaffolding. So here you can see this is bamboo scaffolding you see in the Far East. Steel scaffolding you see in the West. They both have a good idea of what the building's got to be, but you put the scaffolding up where you build a building. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, this is a nutrient lattice. If you get a bad burn, you put the lattice over the burn. The skin regrows around the lattice, but the lattice provides nutrient to the skin and dissolves in the process. So the scaffolding disappears as the thing evolves. This is a microcardial lattice. 
where you actually put something on the heart and it dissolves gradually into the heart and leaves microelectrical filaments within the heart. So the scaffolding leaves things in place which will be valuable later, but where they settle is an evolutionary process. Yeah. Uh, this is called a shadow scaffolding. If you want extreme sports, you've got 50 or 60 years of development to get the infrastructure, the experience and the practice in place. You can't design it from scratch. And of course, in a keystone, once that stone is in place, the structure is stable. But if you've ever been to the catacombs in Rome, you're actually standing on the top of several layers of, of arches. If somebody one day removes the wrong keystone, the whole thing will collapse. Think about legacy code, right? which people aren't thinking about. So the whole concept here is you actually need to pick a different type of structure or a different type of lattice. And that means I finish off with my cat. This is from Rudyard Kipling. Uh, my favorite story in the Just So stories about the cat who walks alone and all places are alike unto him. Yeah, so the cat has chosen to exploit human beings for milk and comfort and warmth and will provide something in return. But ultimately, the cat will still go into the wet, wild woods and will discover novelty. Agile needs to be more cat-like and less like a domestic dog. Thank you very much for your time.